This Week in Startups is brought to you by Wistia. Create your free Wistia account today and get started hosting your videos in just minutes at wistia.com slash twist. And Blue Apron. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash twist. Hey, everybody. Welcome to This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis, and this is the program where we talk about entrepreneurship, technology, and the news, which there has been a ton of news. We're sitting here the week after President-elect Donald Trump has taken over, and boy, has it been just an amazing week already. I, wait, it's not even a week. Is it three days? I think it's, this is day four. Day four of the presidency. Uh, with me today, Katie Banner from the New York Times. Welcome back to the program. Thanks. And we'll be talking to Katie about uh, some of her great coverage of Snap, previously known as Snapchat. And Amir Efrati is here again. He is at Amir on the Twitter from the information, that amazing new source. Um, you have to pay for it. Or you can get the first half of the article for free. Sometimes people unlock them. First couple sentences. Yeah. First couple sentences. You get the idea of the story. Um, and he's got um, a lot of news he's been working on, especially around our favorite company here, Uber. <laughs> we have to have like a da 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 sound every time we say Uber here. Um, hey, Katie, let's start with you. Snapchat is getting ready for this uh, huge IPO. They have filed. Um, but it's been a pretty secretive company. Mm -hmm. And now they're having to explain what exactly their business is. Yes. And they have to fix a bunch, bunch of things. And mm -hmm. people are saying it's going to be a $25 billion company when it comes out. Yeah. Is that... A realistic valuation, or is that sort of? Are we getting into bubble territory now? I think that's a realistic valuation, and uh, I, I don't know if "fix" is the word I would use. I think they're just trying to tweak some things around messaging. A lot of a lot of current events have come out since the election that have encouraged Snapchat to do things like distance themselves from Facebook a little bit, even though Facebook is a tremendously successful company. You know, just to say that we don't have certain problems that could be significant around things like fake news yeah. or around things like misinformation. Um, and then they also want to sort of clean up the site because they were sued in July over having uh, far too racy and graphic images. And so though that was settled, they've decided to add certain tools. Ah. Like racy. age gating. Oh, there is age gating because yes. that was one of the big um, things I heard from young people or parents was all the porn stars are on Snapchat. Yeah. So they can't, they can't, uh, there, there, there are standards for what you and I can do in our Snapchat accounts and right. things that we're not supposed to do. This is for publishers on Discover, ah. which is the part of Snapchat that has things like CNN and Wall Street Journal and Daily MTV, Mall. Daily Mail. Daily Mail, Mail which does a lot of Kim Kardashian stories and a lot of coverage of Pippa Middleton's. Yeah. But yeah, so how, like. How important is Discover really? Is that is that just for optics for um, for the company to have? Because it, there, there's no way that it's going to be, you know, the most important it's source not, of revenue, right? And, it's not now, but it's growing. So I think they have, uh, I forgot the number in my story, I think it was 100 million users on Discover every month. And, Isn't that you know, where it, they insert the ads? Or they just put them between your friends, too. They, they put it in the interstitials and the stories that they make right. in your own stories if you have enough people looking at them, and then in Discover. So it's a place for them to put, like, higher, for them to put more expensive advertising. But Discover has grown. So a year ago, you could argue that very, very few people looked at Discover. Mm -hmm. So their growth rate, and I think this is one of the things about Wall Street, the growth rate's doing this. It's going up into the right very quickly, even if it's off a small base. Do you think they're going to disclose time spent for Discover versus the core part of the app? My sense is they already do disclose time spent in Discover to the publishers mm -hmm. themselves. So if you're a publisher negotiating to be on Discover, you do get metrics like um, how many people looked at your story, how many people looked at each tile in your story, each video, and for how long. So those metrics are out there. And do you really think outside of um, you know, maybe BuzzFeed or, or Cosmo and, and maybe a couple of others, it's, it's really a worthwhile bargain for the media companies? Has it really proven itself? I think it's changed. So I think at first, when the audience was very tiny, people were saying, why bother doing this, especially when Snapchat forces media companies to do so much more work around reformatting stories. Mm. I will say the New York Times is not on Snapchat Discover. Wall Street Journal is. And I think that... Um, there are people who were really skeptical of Discover at first and kind of wrote it off. Now, as more people come to both Snapchat 
Snapchat, not Snap, Snapchat the app, and Discover, and Discover rolls out around the globe, and they're starting to gather an audience of people in places outside of the U.S. Um, it feels like a why not? Like, a, okay, this isn't the worst way to invest one's money because the audience is growing. And we'll see a lot of television on there soon. I think. This oh, year, really? Right? You think people are going to start watching TV they're in that horrible put, aspect ratio? They're gonna, yes, yes, they're going to put that on. And according to Farhad, uh, that's great. Right, the, well, the vertical stuff is, is good. It's right? horrible. It is horrible. It's so the vertical disastrous. video, I'm like, not going to argue for. If, if they're retrofitting, it's probably horrible. Right? right, they would be cutting off the left yeah. and the right. Which is what they're, so they're and zoom. And they're not, so they're asking people to not retrofit. So this is one of the things they want to make original discover. content, original content for discover. for that stupid format of a phone. Yes, and that's that what people are ratio. doing. So e entertainment, so they're killing news, cinema. MTV, other folks have decided to sign on and say Comedy Central, excuse me, not MTV, Comedy Central, e entertainment news have signed on and said, okay, we will make original video for Snapchat. And so that's another thing. It's it's an investment that has not yet panned out. Yeah. And then Snapchat wants more people to do this because they want to present themselves as an alternative to television rather than as an alternative to Facebook. And people spend a lot, the people who are addicted to Snapchat are spending 30 minutes, 45 minutes in the app. Do you know any people like that, though? Uh, young people. There are young people, like I was actually literally watching my nephews who are very young, and they were... In, I think it's in fifth grade or sixth grade, and I mean, all day long in Snapchat. Like every snap a friend sends, they check. It's almost like the early days of Twitter when you got a tweet from somebody, it was like, wow, this is high signal. I've got to read the tweet. If they took the time to write a tweet, that was considered. They really thought that through. <laughs> and I think that's how they view these snaps. It's like, I cannot miss a snap by certain people. And then you look at certain people like um, DJ Khaled and, and Kim Kardashian, these people, I mean, or the other Kardashian sisters, I don't know their names, but they seem to put. 50 of them up a day, 25 of them a day. So I started following some of them and I'm like, I can't follow these people. It's just too many. I'm like hitting with my thumb over and over again. So you think the comparison with Twitter is apt going forward? Mm, I don't know. It seems to me like Twitter's for a different group of people trying to accomplish a different Small, task. Smaller group. It's a, it's a broadcast platform. It's hard yeah. to broadcast on Snapchat. <clears throat> Discover is one of the yeah, only Yeah, I can't find where, anybody on Snapchat. Right. They, and it seems like they're, by Not yet. it's by yeah. design, right? They could have very easily said, here's a URL, put your public stuff up. It's not public. And I think this is why Instagram is kicking their butt with you know, the over 30 crowd, let's call it. I was just talking to our makeup person here, um, and she was like, really big on snap because we would snap when she was doing my makeup and then now she's getting really big on the instagram stories the instagram stories seem to me to be a better version of snapchat for everybody and you can very easily find people on snap on instagram rather right so and influencers it, can use inst so influencers i hate that word so people who have large social media following notable people large enough yeah like whether Jason. or not they're famous that brands will come to them and say will you hold my can of pepsi in your Right. Instagram photo because you seem to have 300,000 followers because you're really buff or whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. People like that can use Instagram easily as a broadcast platform because it's so easy to find people. It's right. the opposite on Snapchat and Snapchat even discourages it and you're not, you're not allowed to sell goods in your Snapchat yeah. like that. So um, I think part of that is because Snapchat wants to control all of the revenue as well. So if you're Gatorade yeah. and you think, I can pay this influencer dude who's like a really good surfer and has a gazillion followers this tiny amount of money to hold, my, to hold Gatorade once a week. Yeah. Or I can pay Snapchat this ginormous amount of money yeah. for a Gatorade. You're going to do the end run. During, during their NFL story, you're, you're going to go with the influencer. And so you can, you can go under the radar because Facebook also doesn't allow it. And Twitter doesn't allow it. And I, I'm sorry, Facebook doesn't allow it and YouTube doesn't allow it. And I talk to executives about both of those. I'm like, well, we embed our ads in This Week in Startups. Right. I read the ads. So what am I supposed to do? Like cut that out? I'm not going to do that. So I just won't put it on right. YouTube and Facebook. And they're like, yeah, no, no, we don't police it. It's only when it gets and to- And they're big, you're, they're easy, you're easy to find on Facebook and YouTube as right. well. It's really, it would be harder to find you on Snapchat. Well, so they're, they've been hiring great. search engineers and they acquired Verb. And so we're mm -hmm. going to see a lot more search capabilities on, sure. on Snapchat, right? Yes, but I think they're still going to try to discourage influencers at least through the IPO so they can control the revenue stream. And what was the revenue? Does anybody know the revenue off the top of their head that they had hundreds of millions? I think it was supposed to be uh, 300 million in 2016 and a billion, and a billion this, this year. year. Yeah. That's the goal. Triple it. Um, Which is yeah, more than triple, presumably yeah. why they filed for an IPO 
before the revenue hit a billion dollars so they could file confidentially. Mm-hmm. Ah, right. Yeah, so the S1 is due out any day now, um, right. and that'll be a feeding frenzy for many more days after, months after. What a bummer. Uh, <laughs> bummer for some of us. Is this, are the spectacles us. like material, do you think? Is that a material thing for people to look at with a company and say, hey, that indicates a further direction, or is it a novelty? Because they bought that company, what, four years ago, three years ago, that was making spectacles? Yeah. Um, it was like this little company that bounced around from incubator and you know pitch competition to pitch competition. I remember it. Um, I think they were at the demo conference and a bunch of stuff five years ago, and they bought it. You didn't hear anything about it. Now Snap Spectacles are out. I think it's been a real marketing phenomenon. I don't know that it's been mm-hmm. like material to their revenue, but they've done such a good job creating desire for spectacles. When I was in New York on the third day. I went to the spectacle store in New York. It opened at 6 a.m. and I was there at 4.30 in the morning. The line was already around the block. It was down the street and then up Fifth Avenue for two blocks. And they were near the Apple store, right? They were basically across the street from the Apple. It's like Apple, Cartier, and Snap. And, uh, but they put it on the street? No, no, it's in it. So for the New York store, they actually had a physical store, but it was ah, just a pop up store. It was, it was a pop up store with only the, the vending machine in it. So, wow. and that were there one, people there around the vending machine, like navigating it and making sure people didn't create yes. a riot for their spectacles? <laughs> yes. And at that point, by six o'clock, somebody came out of the store and said, listen, you know, this back third of the line, you're not going to get them today. Right. That was at 6 a.m. And a. that kind of. Cl- so did you that, get one? No, I wasn't. I was just there to look at the line. Oh. <laughs> I think but, it's a pretty. But it was neat, amazing. Yeah, it's a pretty neat product in that when you were doing something first person in the way GoPro was a very neat product, but most people wouldn't buy a GoPro, right? right. It's just too hard to strap it on and wear the gear, and it's expensive. Like for a hundred bucks, those things are so cheap. If they actually had them freely available, I wonder what the sell-through would be. They're very easy to use. There's a pair flying around the New York Times, two pair, because Mike Delimer said did wait in line for five hours, Good and for he him. and he got he got two pair, <laughs> and they're they're extremely easy to use and super fun. And it's a you know it's a baby step for them. I mean, th- this is the beginning of a long hardware. Is it going to be road. AR? Do you yeah. think it's going to be an AR thing? Absolutely. What would, it, it already is. Absolutely. I mean, you use the filters, you know. It's, you're already augmenting yourself and your videos sure. all the time. But when you look out at the real world, so that's sort of like, I guess it's interesting. Putting the filters on is kind of like post-AR. Like I've made the video and I'm now, well, no, I actually do it concurrently. But when I look out at the world, does the world change? So the looking through the glasses, that makes me see something in the real world. What do you think you would actually see in the real world, don't answer that question, we'll answer what Snapchat would project into your real world when we get back after this important message. Hey everybody, you know how much I love Wistia, you know how much I love having control of my videos and how they're presented and the ability to grow our mailing list at This Week in Startups. So when you go to thisweekinstartups.com, you're gonna see we use a product called Wistia, W-I-S, T-I-A, Wistia.com. Go to Wistia.com slash twist and you'll get a free account and you'll start hosting videos in minutes. Now, why is this so important? It's so important because you need to control in a business setting or in your podcast setting, you want to control the experience when people watch your video. You don't want wacky annotations, all kinds of ads layered onto it, cruft garbage. And you certainly don't want your competitors' videos coming up and suggestions all around it. You want to control your experience and have a beautiful, clean experience that allows you to do high-end marketing techniques like put videos behind a paywall or a password and to get people to sign up with an email and give them that prompt, hey, want to get the next episode, come to the launch festival free, put your email in, hey, want to get a white paper? Uh, They have over 330 people using Wistia now. When they started on This Week in Startups, just like two or three years ago, they only had 50,000. So this company is growing amazingly. I mean, I wish I could be an investor in it. They are crushing it. And you get great analytics, trends, viewer streams. You can really see like, oh, people are rewinding the video and watching this section twice. I always find that fascinating. And as I said, it's super easy to use. You have tons of support. And one of the things they do great, and listen, you can go look at this for free. On their blog, they explain how to use microphones, how to use cameras, how to edit, how to make great content all because they know that if you're coming from a business situation, you may not have made video before. 
but your consumers are demanding video and they want video on a regular basis. Video is the best way to communicate. You're hearing my voice. You're seeing me on thisweekinstartups.com. You want to watch videos. When you come look at a product, service, or any website, you look for the video first, and Wistia is going to help you make and serve those great videos. They integrate with all the major email and marketing automation tools. Clients include MailChimp, Moz, HubSpot, Zendesk, Herman Miller, Sam Adams, and, of course, This Week in Startups and Launch. We love it and get their guides to build using the right microphones and lighting and setup and all that kind of stuff. It's really great hacks. Wistia.com slash twist. I love this product. Go use it. Okay, let's get back to the program. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis. You can follow me on Twitter at Jason, and you can follow Katie Benner at KT Benner, B-E-N-N-E-R, from the at New York Times, and Amir is at Amir, and he is from at The Information. Always follow the Twitter handles to get all that great information. When we left our amazing roundtable, we uh, were talking about Snapchat's AR, augmented reality, changing the world. Do, can you think of something they would project on the real world through those glasses that would be in line with the culture slash what, gestalt of Snapchat? Maybe some of the things that you can already put onto the, onto your images in the app. But what we, Amir and so I, I'm I gonna were gonna walk around and see everybody sticking out big puppy tongues. And that would be ears. awesome. Now, what Amir like, and I were today's just, a bummer. I just want everybody to be kittens in the world. Can you imagine? On oh, never mind. I won't. I won't go in political. The tender but. Line. <laughs> yes. Be careful now. Be careful now. Be careful. No politics. No, no politics and no comedy anymore. But what's great about Snapchat is that they've gotten us all to use AR and mm-hmm. embrace it and love it without ever calling it AR right. because they're consumer first and they're filtered. And yeah. unlike Google, Although behind the scenes, they do want everyone to know they are the AR company. They just course. won't say that publicly because if you're a 13 year old somewhere in the Midwest, yeah, you, you, don't care. you don't care. You just want yeah. to put a puppy face on. Like I want right. To put a puppy they're just face thinking on. about what's fun. So kudos to them. So. Mm-hmm. Can't, we can't think of anything that would actually happen in the real world. What if you could, in the real world, put your snap code above your head? And so, like, I'm, you know, we're on your shoulders. Promotional. Yeah. You know, my yeah. little snap code would be there, and I'd be like, oh, that person's on snap. I can, I can just press this button and now follow them. Hmm. It'd be like the world would be your directory. Or create filters location-based that your friends could go find, like a treasure hunt. That'd be fun. Yeah. That'd I've be seen cool. the Japanese companies were doing that kind of stuff yeah. literally six or seven years ago. Yeah. Little treasure hunts. You know, I think it was Tonchi Dot was the company that was doing it um, that launched at the conference a long time ago. You could put little messages for people or leave little objects for them in the real world, and then they would stumble upon them. Of course, the chances of you doing that were incredibly low. Hey, in related news, um, uh, no, not related in any way. <laughs> Autonomous vehicles are uh, becoming a reality. This week, Tesla was cleared of wrongdoing in the horrible, tragic death of a Navy SEAL who was a super fan of. Um, Tesla's. I think the basic uh, NTHSB National Transportation is Highway. It NHTSA. N- is it NHTSA? Yeah. Who, th- the th- there's a highway, highway one. Transportation, Transportation Safety S- and Safety Association. And safety, yeah, yeah, yeah right they exist. I mean, Trump's disbanded them, but they, before they were disbanded. <laughs> I just like read today, like everything's been disbanded. No, 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 We're not disbanding that. <laughs> actually, not disbanding the, that. Please do not present There's alternative no facts. The transportation <laughs> secretary is actually one that uh, I think got you, you kind of unanimous support. Oh, really? Um, Unlike the educational secretary, like most of the others, who just yeah. got demolished. That was just really scary and entertaining at the same time. But um, what so, what I thought was pretty interesting about this Tesla news, the obviously. It's tragic, but the person had seven seconds to avoid the truck in front of them. The autopilot was never designed to be a level four, you know, fully door-to-door autonomous system. You're not supposed to go to sleep. It tells you over and over again, I have one of these cars. It tells you over and over again, don't fall asleep. You have to. Do you use autopilot mode? All the, every day. Yeah. If I'm on a highway, yes. What does it allow you to do? It allows me, well, number one, I get motion sickness. One thing I found is, and I get very light motion sickness if I'm driving, I usually don't, but just like adaptive cruise control mm-hmm. kind of removes fatigue and you have a smoother ride, lane assist gives mm-hmm. you a much smoother ride and changing lanes, it gets very addictive to use the steering column to switch lanes. So there's really three features. One, you stay in the lane perfectly, which I like. Two, adaptive cruise control that you can set the distance. Mm-hmm. So I like to set it at a full seven car lengths unless I'm in traffic and then I'll just put it on one. Yeah. And what it allows me to do is when I, I, listen, I don't text when I'm driving. I don't do any of that nonsense. But if I am changing the radio or loading a podcast, you have like a second to do that. 
you don't feel panic. You know that sense of panic that if you take just your eyes off the road for a second and go to the GPS, you don't feel that state of utter panic mm -hmm. because you know the car can drive better than you. And the statistics are now showing, and I think that was the big part of this report, Yeah, was- No doubt. You 40% less accidents in Teslas. Now, Amir, correct me if I'm wrong, we've entered a new era now of safety in cars because every Tesla is online with a 4G connection. Every crash is recorded down to the most minute detail. Mm -hmm. So we're actually gonna get statistics that are bulletproof, essentially, on safety. And since they do over-the-air updates, in other words, the software in the car gets updated over your 4G LTE connection, when they update the software, we'll actually know, yeah, in the 100 days since the software came out, the number of crashes compared to the 100 days of the last software and the second generation software two times ago was down, whatever, 48% year over year and 12% quarter over quarter. This is an entirely new concept for safety in cars. It is exciting, and, and Tesla has done a good job marketing autopilot. It's certainly not the only semi-autonomous solution out there. So we, we forget yeah. that there are vehicles that have a lot more distribution than Tesla does that have these sorts of things. The Audis, I think, have um, adaptive yeah, cruise control. Mercedes and has things. Pl plenty of things. And G GM is actually coming out with a really uh, interesting, um, uh, I forget what theirs is called, super super drive or something, but um, uh, a s similar scenario that it's it's kind of paying, it's actually paying attention to you to make sure that you're uh, not, you know, uh, looking away or not paying attention. Um, the Tesla but, does this to a small extent. If your hands come off the steering wheel, right. it'll alert you to put your hands on the steering wheel. And then if you don't, it locks you out for bad behavior. It's very naggy. But these are, these it's are- It's really naggy. <laughs> these um, are- Because sometimes if you have your hand loosely on the steering wheel, actually, it will say, put your hand on the steering wheel. Oh, really? Okay. If you're driving, like, like Vinny Bag of Donuts when I was in Brooklyn would drive his Cadillac with two fingers. He would just have his hand on the bottom, like six o'clock of the steering wheel, just two fingers. Mm. But that was Vinny Bag of Donuts. His other guys would put 10 and two. But anyway, you were saying. I mean, um, <laughs> Katie's cracking up I won't, over here. I won't date myself in, in the same way. Uh, <laughs> these are semi-autonomous semi kind yeah. of solutions that are, that are bubbling up and they will become standard over time and that's a really good yeah. thing. So I think there are plenty of arguments to be made that these sorts of things and, and emergency braking or whatever you want to call it. Actually, I just saw a commercial for I think a Kia car. They called it autonomous emergency braking, which is stupid. Um, but yeah. the word autonomous They should know, have called it digital autonomous emergency braking. Yes. Cyber digital exactly. autonomous digital braking in be the a new lot of Kia. That. There's going to be a lot of You're going to hear the word autonomous a lot in yeah. all kinds of mass marketing, but uh, I don't, I'm not sure that's a good idea. Kind of like AR. It's like, why, why yeah. do it? But um, uh, but these are not full solutions, right? right? So this is this is a far cry from from where we want to get to, and there is a massive amount of debate about the best path to get there. A lot of people think Tesla is not necessarily in the best position to get us there. Um, Why is of, that? Of all the Why? companies, because they seem to be in the pole position. To me, listen, I don't, I'm, I don't, I'm not an angel investor. I sold my stock in Tesla like an idiot, but. Um, what, why do people not believe Tesla is in the pole position when I, it's the only car I know that has this level of intensity in terms of self-driving and this level of updates? I mean, he's updating it every three to six months, it feels like. I mean, nobody even has yeah. these, this so, level in the market. Ve very simple. Um, uh, a couple of reasons. First of all, um, autopilot is for highway driving, mm -hmm. right? And um, the thing that the Tesla doesn't have, it doesn't believe in is uh, a LIDAR. Mm -hmm. And this has been an area of huge debate in the industry where pretty much I would say 95% of people think that it's a very good idea to have more data, not less data mm -hmm. when helping a car decide where to go. So uh, Elon, along with startups who frankly don't have a budget to create a system um, with adequate LIDAR coverage, uh, they're the only ones who think that it's not necessary. Um, and I think that there are gonna be um, too many holes. Cameras are not good enough and, and radars and plus cameras are not good enough to get us to uh, kind of perfect uh, autonomous driving. You don't believe so? Um, based on the evidence that I've seen or at least the arguments that are, mm. that are being made by you know, um, pretty much everyone else in the industry. The answer not is no. Not being Google, which uses a LiDAR system. Among others, not just Google, but right. yeah. I, I, I think Uber's is a LiDAR system too, right? Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. They, so they, you're basically building a huge model of the real world right. 
but it adds like thirty, forty thousand dollars to the cost of the car. Right? Not necessarily. I think the, the costs are coming down. Mm. Um, I don't know why that's been a, a stumbling block for for Elon. It certainly is not pretty looking. It's ugly. It sticks out. These are yeah. things that are not design loving mm. features. Yeah. Um, but it it seems like the industry believes that they're necessary. There's a huge debate and. The one thing, I know we're probably going to talk about CES in a second, but the one thing that I learned at CES is that um, nobody knows what they're doing. Uh, the car companies are taking multiple approaches because they have no idea what's going to work. They have no right. clue. They're investing in uh, multiple companies. They got multiple pokers in the fire. Katie, how soon do you think it is before we see um, uh, Teslas and other cars with self-driving be, let's call it, five or 10 times safer than regular cars. We saw this 40% decrease, oh, but let's just go for the 10X. In other words, if you're in an autonomous car, currently constructed, not fully autonomous, but with these autonomous emergency braking, lane assist, et cetera, um, is it going to be 10x in a year, or is it going to be 10x in 10 years? I mean, it I seems like it's moving pretty fast. I was going to say, like, the increase in safety is moving very quickly, but everything you're talking about until it becomes a reality for the majority of vehicles, it's yeah. really mostly exciting for insurance companies. I mean, if you think about the industry that is going to benefit early on from all of this data, it's probably insurers. Why is that? Because they'll have more behavioral data about what causes accidents, their, their actuarial tables, and the way that they look at probabilistic um, if the, way, the probabilities that they assign to different kinds of accidents mm -hmm. occurring right now, it's pretty crude. It's like, if you're a male under the age of 24, you're at higher risk because we just think that the, that group of people exhibits riskier yeah. behavior. Yeah. So they'll have more granular data around what actually causes accidents yeah. and what they should be insuring for Not and at what level. Not just their own level. Right, for example. And there are a lot of dash, dash cam um, you know, efforts out there, including some companies like one called Nexar that's from Israel. And they're getting you know, basically smartphones up in these cars um, to record things that are happening. For, again, to, to help insurance companies. Yeah. So um, if insurance companies can lower the amount of accidents, encourage... And safer, lower their costs. Would lower their costs of paying for fender bender. So we're very quickly going to be in a world where the idea of a fender bender will not exist. You, in, for all intents and purposes, cars without with this emergency braking cannot get in a fender bender unless they're hit. Right. So you're basically, every time you put one of these cars on the road... You're reducing the number of fender benders by whatever so percentage So it'll change your is. premiums. So what will happen is if you have a car um, that has some of these these better technologies, your premium will be lower than if ah. you have the car that I would own, which is not a Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> what, by choice or because you have a different brand? Budget. You like? A budget. Well, you'll have the Model 3 coming very soon. Good to know. I'll put that on my list. 35 dimes. But I think, I think if I'm not mistaken, uh, emergency braking or collision avoidance is supposed to be standard within the next five years or so for yeah. all car, all new cars. Yeah. Yeah. So like so things are be, moving in the right so direction. Exactly. So it's punitive if you don't, ha if you don't upgrade your vehicle, but soon mm -hmm. all the new cars will be yeah. equipped. And would that mean the end of insurance at some point or insurance would become so cheap because there are chances of somebody dying in a car. Let's just assume fender benders go away 100%. Like they become, a, you know, one in a million, 10 million car scenario. Um, and then deaths go down by 95% or 99%. What's going to happen to the actual insurance business? Doesn't it contract at a certain point? So this might be good in the short term to lower costs, but isn't the whole concept of insurance going to go away in the same way that hurts as a rent-a-car company doesn't need to exist if you have ride-sharing plus autonomous cars? Like what's the future of Hertz and Avis? It feels like that's going to zero too. I'm just thinking longer term, like 20 years. I really don't have an, I, I, I don't have an answer for that. Yeah. Everyone's trying to figure this out. I think insurance is going to go away. That's my belief, is insurance is going to become so de minimis and ridiculously low that, you know, that whole industry, I mean, I think that's the industry to short. Yeah, we talk all the time about technology erasing blue collar jobs, but yeah. white collar jobs are going to go away too. Yeah. yeah, but this, uh, this will take like a couple. This will, this will take, take a while, a, a, a long time, like more than a generation. Because we still have Hertz, <laughs> for example. Barely. I used Hertz the other day for the first time in so long. It was the most arduous and painful experience of my life. It was like the Louis, Louis C.K. kind of talk of just how painful <laughs> things are once you have easier solutions. Like the idea of like 
bringing the car back and getting the receipt and the guy having to fill the tank and the insurance cost and the waiting to get the car and the waiting to drop the car off. And they're, and, and so enterprise is the big gun uh, on the rental side and they're, they're essentially relying on insurance because insurance companies will pay for people while their car is being repaired to use enterprise. So that's their, that's their cash cow. But um, what's interesting about enterprise is there's a lot of buzz in Silicon Valley about enterprise because they have fleet management capabilities. They actually have a business where they manage fleets for corporations. Ah. Um, and and kind of know how to move them around and buy them and sell them and so on. And uh, so in the future where we have fleets of autonomous cars, you know, 10, 20 years down the line, that's the kind of company that has that sort of expertise and they can help a variety ah. of players. So they'll they'll remain in some way, shape or form. Um, they may not be buying a, a, million car, a million cars a year to loan out to everyone, but um, they'll be around. And Fiat is, according to your story, just making the, this is before the, the new year, you had a story about Fiat, I remember, which seems like kind of like Fiat's the one that's actually moving quickly. That's no, kind of so, weird. So, uh, so it's, it's interesting. There's, a, there's kind of a, a spectrum. I won't, I won't um, uh, go, go too long into this, but there's a spectrum of beliefs in terms of, um, in terms of how uh, widely available or commoditized autonomous driving tech will be. Um, Fiat's on the side of they think it will happen sooner than later. They think it will be available to all and they'll be able to benefit. And what's interesting is that they're, they're putting a lot of focus into kind of tweaking autonomous driving features to make them unique. So if you're like in a Dodge, whatever, Charger, it'll be super aggressive autonomous driving oh. versus, you know, kind of a hoity-toity car, which might be a, a lot more passive. Oh. So there are going to be all these differences. It's like not just going to be the same. It's not going to be the same autonomous right. driving experience. And the Tesla autopilot that you have is not the same as the Mercedes auto autopilot. There are right. differences. Um, so say, that's what they're literally going to sell us. They'll be like, the new Mercedes S-Class. With Jarvis, All right. you're but, a super obedient, classy <laughs> self-driver. And then they're going to be like, get this you know, Chrysler Sebring, and you could drive like an old biddy at the speed limit in the left-hand lane and make everybody insane. You have a great marketing career ahead of you, I can tell. I do. I you're do. Good. Hey, when we get back, Sprint has bought 30%, 33% of Jay-Z's title, which apparently is still in business, and he bought it for $50 million and they're paying $200 million for a third of it. I don't know what's going on right there. And... Um, yeah, we're going to have to. I, I, I'm loath to do it, but we're going to have to at least talk a little bit about Trump uh, because he's got a new FCC chief um, who is not a fan of net neutrality. And breaking news, my gosh, uh, Trump has now silenced government scientists with gag orders through some sort of executive order. What? Employees of the Environmental Protection Agency and Department of Agriculture are not going to be able to talk to the press uh, more when we come back after this important message. Hey, everybody, I want to tell you about a great product, which you've probably heard about, but maybe you haven't tried yet, and I have tried it, and I love it. It has become a big hit in my household with my seven-year-old daughter. It's called blueapron.com. My wife loves it, too. Go to blueapron.com slash twist, and you'll get your first three meals free with free shipping. It is an incredible experience. You get a box. It's obviously refrigerated, and all the ingredients and a beautiful menu card and a recipe card of how to make the product. So I've always wanted to make pizza at home. I've never done it. I mean, I made English muffin pizzas. You know, this is what we call Irish pizza when you grow up in Brooklyn. But they sent a beautiful pizza dough and beautiful sauce and cheese and everything, all perfectly portion-sized and an easy-to-follow recipe. Then... The other thing I've always wanted to learn how to cook is General Tso's chicken. That was one of my favorites when I was in New York and I was living on the west side in Hell's Kitchen. I walk home from the garden after watching the Knicks win a playoff game. I get General Tso's chicken. I never knew how to make it. They give you all the ingredients, a little cornstarch, so all these little syrups, and you like a little uh, professional chef. Everything just goes smoothly. It is an incredible experience. It's also affordable. You get a ton of variety. It's super flexible. You get the deliveries when you want. Um, and it really, it, I was just amazed by the quality of the bok choy, of the chicken. Everything was the highest quality. And 
it saves you not only from going to the supermarket, not only from getting a recipe, but also the portion sizes and, and how to put this all together. It makes cooking delightful again, and they are in partnership with 150 local U.S. farms, fisheries, ranchers, and they, you know, sort of a big seafood fan, and we love going to the Monter Monterey Bay uh, Aquarium. And when I went there last time, they had this beautiful card that told you which fishes you should order, which are sustainable, but it's very hard to, to actually get that uh, certified. You know, people lie when they sell you fish. You don't know what you're getting. You don't know if it's actually sustainable or not. And even some of the stuff that's farm raised is actually not good for the environment. Well, you know what? Blue Apron takes all that away. They do all of that important work for your family. And it's very important to our family that we order sustainable stuff and we and we don't take stuff from the ocean that's not sustainable. It's a, it's a big movement uh, amongst considered people. So the fact that they use the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch list to me and their standards is very impressive. Um, prep is, you know, 30 minutes, 40 minutes. It's super, I mean, we did it faster in some cases, but we're fast cooks. Um, it tastes great. It's easy. It's a better way to cook. It is a better way to cook. Just, and also delicious. I mean, I made this beautiful Sicilian pizza and my daughter ate it all. It was one of those great experiences where we, you know, she was looking in the oven, counting the minutes. So blueapron.com slash twist, blueapron.com slash twist, T-W-I-S-T, and you'll get your first three meals free with free shipping. It is amazing. All right, let's get back to this amazing program. Hey, everybody, welcome back to This Week in Startups, the show where we talk about the great United States of America and our amazing Supreme Leader, <laughs> Donald Trump. Um, boy, has it been an interesting couple of days with these um, nominees uh, going through their hearings. Pretty, pretty brutal, but um, I guess the one that relates mostly to technology is that the FCC chief, uh, Ajit Pai, mm -hmm. I think I'm pronouncing it correctly. You don't follow him on Twitter? I do follow him on Twitter he's now. He's pretty active. He's pretty active. Yeah. He's not a fan of net neutrality. Right. He wants it to be a free-for-all. Now, listen, I'm no genius on this, but I thought that we gave everybody essentially franchises in bandwidth. Therefore, they essentially have mini monopolies or quasi-monopolies. What do you call multiple? Is it oligopoly? What do you call like a multiple monopoly? Like a... Anyway, oligopoly, oligopoly. oligopoly the kind of oligopoly-esque uh, system here. So now they want to let those people who don't have competition then be able to meter traffic or slice and dice it and get rid of net neutrality. This seems to me to be incongruous. What do you think, Katie? Well, I think that the tech industry was so, you know, the tech industry is, does not seem overly political, but on some issues, you'll see leaders come out and speak very publicly for or against something. With net neutrality, we saw folks like uh, Reed Hastings make very public statements saying that they believe strongly in it. So it will be interesting to, for me anyway, he, to he see- He doesn't have profits yet, so he really needs it. He needs, he needs <laughs> it. But, but the other companies- But it'll be interesting to see if people come out and are as vocal as they were when they were fighting the neutrality, neutrality battle before. I'm sure some of them will be, but if you think about it, I, I don't know, for, for a company like Google or Facebook, I think in, in theory, obviously, they would, they would resist um, changes to these rules, but they're, they resist, they're already because... successful. Oh, because they have to pay, in our they'll Comcast pay more. They'll might pay more. say, yeah, they oh, don't want to pay us. us. But, but they can, to afford, reach by the way, customers. they can afford it. And they can afford they it. They throw and, off and cash. They have more profits. money than they know yeah. what to do with. So in reality, does it actually matter to Google? Eh, right. you know, in, it, it advantages in, uh, them. Yeah, that's, and that's, the, that's my question. Oh, I see. Yes. Ultimately, it might advantage them. In the them. back of their minds, are they actually thinking, oh, right. yeah, if this prevents so we'll, future competitors from it's like... It's a win-win in a way. So one of the reasons why Netflix was so adamantly for net neutrality is because they would be so wildly disadvantaged to a mm -hmm. YouTube, which is part sure. of Google. I'm sorry, part of Alphabet. Part of, are they naming themselves something? They're part of Google, Google, which is part, part of Google. It's so part of Google. It is part of Google, and, part of Alphabet. And that's the part of the business that's so profitable right. that they would be able to <clears throat> if they would have a strong advantage over Netflix is all I will say. It's a win-win for people with deep pockets but it would be kind of a bummer for them to then have the Comcast people say you know what we're going to degrade your 4K and your HD down to you know whatever 320 and you're going to have to pay us for every stream going through we want a piece of uh, that action. It would be a bummer but it wouldn't kill them. Yeah, that, that's good. this is going to be a huge, a huge issue for your show to discuss for months 
I think so. it seems like one of these things where people might actually start going out in the street and protesting. I mean, it's not quite abortion level, like a uh, passionate issue for people, but it, it's kind of right below that, I think. Like I, I could see hundreds of thousands of people going into the street and protesting this. On net neutrality? I think I could, yeah. Hmm. Maybe in this part of the country? In sure. San Francisco, sure, yeah. Maybe. San Francisco, yeah. you can get 1,500,000 people into it. Um, so let's talk just generally about, uh, I know, Amir, you gotta, you got to bounce, but let's talk generally about the Trump administration and their interactions with Silicon Valley. I don't usually talk about Elon or my relationship with him in relation to Trump, but I did see a story that came out about- Do you have a relationship with Elon? Well, like friends. Okay. Yeah. Like, so I don't usually talk about it, but they, then I saw Peter Thiel said he was like a sales guy like Trump. And the CNN reporter asked me to comment on it. I don't usually comment, but I commented. Um, and I said, this seems like totally ridiculous. Like Trump is a consummate salesman working in real estate. Like Elon is a sort of visionary engineer who works really in manufacturing Science and space and transportation it couldn't be completely different. Could, couldn't be more different, but they do are completely aligned in the in factories and jobs. And we saw Elon, although te- although Tesla and other car makers want to get rid of as many humans as possible, and right. they're right, like they're, they're so they, they can have, keep all the manufacturing here. Yeah, but, there just won't okay. be a lot of people. They're trying to automate as much of it as possible. Right, but there still have to be s- certain number of people. Mm-hmm. And it does seem that Trump's bullying tactic of like make America great again and put jobs here is working in the short term. You saw Amazon fold that said they would hire more workers. I think what we're going to see though is we're so for, vis-a-vis the tech industry, two things. If It would not be a bad idea if you lead a large tech company to say, I'll give you this thing about workers in America that you can use for your for your own PR for the administration Mm. and in the background negotiate something in return. Right. Starters and the other thing. And the other thing will be taxes, tax repatriation for the so for the very big Silicon Valley companies, the manufacturers, the apples of the world. Um it will also be all about negotiating what repatriation looks like. And it will be something that they are incentivized to do because they can't leave the money in Europe anymore anyway. Mm-hmm. The mm-hmm. EU wants mm-hmm. it. So it's going to be, do we want to give it to the EU or do we want to give it to the US? It's not, do we want to keep right. it anymore? And the EU has Again. started already to say like, yeah, you know what? We'll, yeah. we'll take some of that Apple money. Look at Apple and Ireland. We need money, yeah. Ireland is saying, we actually don't even want this money back from Apple and the EU is saying, no, no, no. This you is have to happen. take it. We're going to get, and so repatriation is something that Obama just couldn't get done for some reason. Well, things have changed. I mean, I think that Hillary Clinton probably could have gotten repatriation done too, only because of the dynamic that's changed in the EU. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's, it's really powerful to say, well, you have to pay the tax money now anyway. So do you want to have the great PR of paying it back to the US or do you want to just give Ah, it all the way to the the EU? Right. What impact will that have on M&A and investment here? Because we're also talking about lower tax rates for companies and individuals. Or especially affluent individuals. And this capital gains deployment, I was talking to a bunch of senior people, investors, VCs, whatnot recently, and they said you're going to be able to depreciate stuff like instantly. So if you had a banner quarter or year, you could build the Apple headquarters and instead of depreciating it, take it against this year's gains. I guess that gives a little bit of optionality. And you're going to be able to bring back tens of billions of dollars in some cases. Is this going to create an M&A bonanza or are they just going to buy back all their stock? Oh, I guess it depends on who you are. If you're Apple yeah. and you know, there's some people would argue that Apple is not as innovative a company as it was right. and that its stock might not move higher because of its great product lineup. So yeah, why not buy back a bunch of stock? I mean, it, it will create, it will be positive for these companies no matter what. I think that even though Silicon Valley seems really opposed to Trump, yeah. there are ways in which the industry, the tech industry overall will do fabulously well. You know, it's a major one that we are talking about is the wealth tax and the inheritance tax. So you used to, I think, be able to give like half of your money to your kids, but there was a special thing that happened where you could put your stock in a trust um, and then any amount that it appreciated over time would be tax-free, would be inheritance tax-free. So if you gave your, you know, if Zuckerberg gave his kids, you know, whatever, $10 million in Facebook shares, and it went to, a, you know, a billion, they wouldn't have to pay tax on that. You know, they would just get it all without the inheritance tax taking it. So the appreciation of the gains would be, you know, sort of set aside. This is becoming a major discussion, as is the carried interest. Yeah. Um, so 
yeah, I guess Silicon Valley doesn't feel as bad about well, things, or are they just scattered? So K- Katie may be very right. And, just about big companies, and, though, because I yeah. think in the startup world, it's very different. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, and and um, we don't we don't know yet, but if if it does turn out that the uh, the tech leaders here not only in the big companies, but in the startups, if they do feel like this is not a good administration um, and they don't like these kinds of political leaders in charge, this is a great wake up call for them to say, okay, I know that I want to make the world better. I should make my backyard better first Mm. and invest a lot more in this country to make sure that there's no perception that people are being left behind um, like there was in, in, in some parts of the country. So I think, uh, hopefully, there will be uh, some of these lessons learned. And it, it's interesting. I don't know if, if you guys um, heard about this guy named uh, Dex uh, Torek. Dex, Dex uh, Torres Tor- Bar- Barton at Tor- Facebook. Barton. Yeah, yeah. Who was, uh, he was at Facebook. He was at Google. He was at uh, Tesla working for Elon. So he knows Eric Schmidt and Mark Zuckerberg and Elon very well. And he's just quit his job working for Elon and is trying to figure out, you know, what are the programs um, – in this country that are working to, you know, nonprofits uh, and, wow. and it, programs that, that are working to help people get better training, to, to have mm-hmm. better jobs and so on. And hopefully there are going to be more people like that who can unleash some of the money here that's been built up and the insane wealth that's been accrued, mm-hmm. but not necessarily spread around the country. And um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what people like him learn. Did you guys read that New Yorker story that came out about the Silicon Valley folks who are wealthy enough to just basically build bomb shelters and flee to New Zealand? I was literally going to bring that up next because there are two dovetail stories that we're wrapped with. Because who cares about Jay Z's title? It's no one. It's significant. It's stupid. <laughs> that's why it had to. Ha- um, so that's why I had this. Gonna, <laughs> yeah, fair warning. If they, if you wanted to listen to that, please tune into another program. <laughs> but this was fascinating, Katie. Um, and people went on the record, which yes. I think is really clueless. Like you know, we're all journalists here, but um, and so if people want to talk, we're going to write down what they say. But for people to come out and explain that they believe society is teetering on. This poss- you know, small possibility society, of chaos. The society that they profited tremendously from. And their solution is... Abandon it. <laughs> is to pull the ripcord, get on a private jet, and watch it burn. Fun. I mean... No wonder I they want to go to Steve, Mars so bad. Steve from... Exactly. We, we trash this planet. Let's Steve go from one. Reddit is brilliant. I love him. I'm a super fan of his. But he's like... Somebody's got to let him know. Like, you, you don't need to talk about these kind of things. It's like, I don't talk about, like... I have four cars. Like you, you don't. When you have four cars, you don't talk about having four cars, right? It's just obnoxious. Unless it's on your own podcast, <laughs> Jason, whatever. Jason, there are people that you know and and interact with and invest with and so on who will literally say things like, you know, when you when you talk about a problem facing yeah. this country or this sure. world, they'll be like, oh, "Don't worry, we'll, we'll go to Mars. We'll fix it. We'll start something new." Right. Um, that's, you know. What yeah. is that movie? Elysium? Is that what it was? Elysium? Uh, Ele- where it, yeah, right. Like, it's like a TV show, <laughs> The terrible, Colony, based terrible on Matt that too. Damon that terrible Matt Damon film. Do not watch film. Elysium. Do not watch it. But the awful. premise is that, you know, there's Yeah, there's the people the up there are place. doing great. Right. We're going to live in the horrible place, but there are going to be other, other people on Mars who are doing There is a... Oh, cor- three, the 3% is a show on Netflix the that three you should percent watch. The yeah. It's a similar concept, but... No, this is a... Um, the In the... Um, after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Kurosawa made a film, I Live in Fear, about a guy. It's one of his lesser known films, but it's probably one of the more intimate and most interesting. And Toshiro Mifune is in it as a guy who is paranoid about radiation and mushroom clouds and decides to sell his entire plantation and his farm and move everybody and his family to South America, which was actually what a lot of Japanese people were doing at the time. They were so, they thought the trade winds would be like when the nuclear holocaust came, you would, you'd be safe there. And that's exactly what these Silicon Valley people look like. They look like they're, they're insane. Like we're gonna build bunkers and have go bags in order to avoid the zombie apocalypse of poor people who are gonna come here and cut their heads off. Like why don't we just work on the problem of people being poor and raise the minimum wage in the Apple stores? One person did say that in the story. It was Max Levchin. Right. And thank God. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when, when Max Levchin is the voice of reason, we've got an interesting situation. No offense to Max, a friend. But, um, and then the final piece, Trump. And I know that the information, uh, not Trump, um, Zuck. So I know that um, the information has the inside line here. He's stuck running for president. What's the story here? Everybody, oh. he's got ploof. 
I know that you've got a straight line into Zuck. <laughs> What's going on? He hangs out at the office. Yeah, he comes he by for lunch sometimes. Information. Amir's he holding the, the line right now. It's it's but visible just below the screen. He's got 12 the line. people updating his Facebook page, and he's got photographers, and he's going state to state, and he's got Pluff. First of all, what uh, is he running for? President? He, being the president of the United States sounds like an awful job. I would never take it. You could not pay me enough to take right. that job. So no, uh, he's he can have way more influence in other ways that so I'm sure. What I think is the he Facebook page for? grooming is pretty standard CEO yeah, stuff. Like I don't CEOs think it's... are vain people, so I don't think that's out of the ordinary. Yeah, I agree with you. I think that after you've checked off a lot of boxes, you're like, hey, MayorJason.com. Hey, maybe that. <laughs> Maybe that could work. Well, maybe Governor Jason. I'm not saying I think he's good for politics. I'm just saying that like the Facebook page grooming and having 12 minions running around making sure that there's nothing bad on it. That's like typical CEO vanity. That's not like uh, that didn't read as anything more to yeah, me. I, but I he was slaughtering goats on his page pretty to, to eat them it. himself <laughs> as part of. And, uh, and he has to appeal sad. to this new. He has to appeal to this new administration too. Remember, mm. you know, he's got he's got to do a lot so of that. Maybe he just wants to build his influence level. So that when things, you know, bubble up, he can have at least a little bit of a negotiating position with Trump. Like, hey, I've been to the heartland, too. I know the Rust Belt. These are my people. I've planted, you know, whatever, tomatoes with them as well, you know. But, I mean, this is just way too strategic to be anything that's not thought out. He has to be running for office. Mm. No? Leader of the free California once we break away. Why would you run for office? Yeah. It's an awful job. It's a terrible job. And, you know, Sheryl Sandberg was going to be... Secretary of the Treasury. According, according to Mike Allen. Yeah, that I believe, actually. So now, if Zuck runs, then Cheryl becomes CEO of Facebook. It's an obvious, obviously what's yeah, going to happen, right? Don't hold your breath. I was going to say, yeah. I, I think that All I right. would see a Cheryl Sandberg for president before I would see a Zuckerberg for president bumper sticker. I think Bloom, just... Bloomberg, Cheryl Sandberg, or Steve K. Cheryl Sandberg. But they have the, to... the silver lining is... Trump is just so outrageous and infuriating and insane that I think it's going to inspire a large number of people to say, uh, maybe I should, I have a shot at that. If he can get in well, there. After, after oh, seeing how we did well, in the debates, I do think a well, lot of people one, are saying I have a shot. I do. <laughs> Jason, one last point. Yeah. If, if we've learned one thing yes. about American elections, yes. just one, yeah. it's that there's something necessary in the modern age. It's called charisma. Mm. Zuck, I'm afraid, has none. <laughs> Ah. Or very little. He's very good at a lot of things. Charisma. Not Is he going to suck you in with his, you know, oration? Yes. His, Absolutely his, not. His delightful anecdotes um, of, and his tales of yore, spinning yarns around the fire. No. He, he's good at a lot of things. Winning an election is not going to be one of them. He would not do great in a debate if he almost had a panic attack on stage with Kara Swisher. He, he's, he's better than that He's now, better than that now. That's that not was, enough. That's, that's not it's enough. It's not, I agree with you. All right, listen, yeah. this has been an amazing episode. Thanks so much to Katie Benner. Katie Benner on the Twitter and Amir Efrati, Amir A-M-I-R from the information. Thanks, Emmy Award-winning producer Jackie, Jake, everybody on the show. And we'll see you all next time. Bye-bye. 